So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. So Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence today. We thank you for that tsunami of love that just washed over us during worship. And we just thank you for the word that's going to come forth. And I just ask Holy Spirit that, um, that this word falls on, on uh, hearts that are ready to receive the seed of your word. And I just surrender myself completely to you. Everything that you want to take place, I am your vessel. I am willing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So... Dad's been talk. He talked to us about baptism last week, and um, the Lord has just really been sharing uh, just water things with me for a few weeks. I just keep getting visions of water. I hear songs that talk about water, and and it's just something that's just been washing over me. <laughs> and when he needed somebody to speak, I, I just turned to him and said, "You know, I've got something about water." I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but the Lord's speaking to me something about water. And he's like, okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about living deep in the river of God. And the title of my message is Don't Fear the Deep End. All throughout the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New, you will find references to water. In fact, God puts such an emphasis on water that even his creation reflects it. The human body is 60% water. Our brain, our heart, lungs, skin, muscles, kidneys, even our bones contain water. So to maintain health, we have to drink lots of water. It's part of God's design. But God's emphasis on water goes beyond just our physical design and health into our spiritual health as well. So in John chapter 4, we see that Jesus, tired from ministry and travel, sits beside Jacob's well and encounters a Samaritan woman and asks her for a drink. So if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to pick up in verse 9, and I believe I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this, is, this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So we all know what happens next. Jesus spoke words of knowledge to the woman, and she, he spoke life over the woman, and she believed he was the Messiah. She drank of the living water. But there are a few extra things that I want to point out from this story. First, everything that Jesus did was by design. Even having that transformative conversation with the woman at Jacob's well was significant. It was symbolic of Jesus moving us from the old covenant, from Jacob's well, to the new covenant. He was telling us not to drink from the old covenant anymore. He was telling us that we are to drink his living water, drink directly from him. Even the fact that she was a Samaritan woman was significant because that means gone were the days of segregation by faith or by heritage. Every believer now, every person on earth was being invited to become part of God's family. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 in the Passion says, for by one spirit we were, are all immersed and mingled into one single body. And no matter our status, whether we are Jews or non-Jews, oppressed or free, we are all privileged to drink deeply the same Holy Spirit. So there was a significance to him saying, you know, why, yes, I am better. <laughs> I can offer you more from, than what Jacob's well is offering you. I offer you something that's salvation for all. So secondly, what is interesting about this woman, this is a personal like, quest of mine, I've studied lots about her, um, and I find her fascinating, is that the early church writings, see the scripture doesn't say a whole lot more about the woman at the well, but early church writings talk a lot about her. 
um, her, they give her name and her significance to the spread of the gospel. Her name was Potini. Potini not only told everyone in her neighborhood about Jesus, but she told her family and they all got saved. She received her baptism at, at the day of Pentecost along with her five sisters and two sons. Then became a radical evangelist across several nations. Potini saw so many people come to Jesus and so many miracles through her ministry that she was considered an apostle equal to the likes of Peter and Paul. Pretty cool, huh? Right? See? Um, she was eventually martyred by her faith and sainted. And Potini didn't just drink from the living water for herself. She took it to other thirsty people. She ministered to rulers. She actually ministered to the rulers uh, in, in uh, Rome, like to kings. They didn't like it. She got the king's, the king's daughter saved. He didn't like it. He threw her in jail, tortured her. At one point in time, her eyes were gouged out, but God restored her sight. Whoa. Miracles, miracles, amazing, amazing miracles. She never stopped telling people about the man that told her everything about herself. And when he told her everything about herself, he didn't just speak about her past. He told her everything she was supposed to be. Go and tell everyone. Yes. He told her who she was supposed to be. He was saying, yes, I've seen who you were, but I'm calling you into this life. This is who you were created to be. So go, sin no more, be the person you were created to be. She jumped into the deep end and she never looked back at her past. The living water Jesus offers doesn't just quench our thirst. It brings radical transformation and empowers us to do what he's called us to do. It's what can take a woman with a colorful history and turn her into a powerful evangelist and, and apostle that reached nations for the gospel. Revelation 22.1 tells us where that living water comes from. And I'm reading from the voice translation here. I like different translations. If you're new here, if, if you have one that you stick with, that's totally fine. But to me, I just love reading from different translations. And it, I feel like the word is like a diamond and each translation is a different facet. And so you just get new revelation every time you read. So from the voice translation, Revelation 22.1. My heavenly God brought me to the river of pure living waters, shimmering as brilliantly as crystal. It flowed out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river of living water flows from the throne of God and Jesus. And personally, I don't believe it just flows from the throne. I believe it literally flows from Jesus Christ himself where he was pierced in the side and blood and water ran out. See, the blood was spilled for the forgiveness of our sins, but the water, the water came out for life and to bring life. So I believe that the river of God literally flows from Jesus Christ himself. It is in that living water that we should live. Turn with me to Ezekiel 47. I'm reading from the New Living Translation this time. In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will flourish wherever this water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea all the way from Engedi to en Englame. <laughs> The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. 
Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea, just as they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and swamps will not be purified. They will still be salty. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall. There will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be food and the leaves for healing. I've often wondered how Ezekiel felt during this vision. You know, was the water cold? Like, was it frigid? Or was it warm and inviting? Was he scared of water? Did he know how to swim? Was he wondering what was going on here? Regardless of those answers, the, he followed the man through the river. He followed him through the changing depths of the river and all the way into the deep end. And I believe God is showing us this river today. Will we be obedient like Ezekiel and follow him into the deep end? Or will we remain satisfied to merely sip of the living water and occasionally stick a toe in? Anyone that's ever gone swimming in a public pool knows that there is a floating rope between the shallow end and the deep end. You know, the rope has little buoys on it and keeps it afloat. And I remember going to the pool um, with Christina and her family, oftentimes over the summer when, when we were kids. And even though I could swim, I didn't swim very well. And so there was safety and security on being in the shallow end. There was this understanding that I can touch here, my head's above water. You know, if anything happens, I can, I can just firmly plant my feet on the ground and I'll be okay. Um, and occasionally I would sneak over into the deep end, but I felt more comfortable in the shallow end or right in the middle where that rope was. I wanted to be able to walk with my head above water without fear of not being able to breathe. I've never, as I mentioned, I've never been a really strong swimmer. In fact, one summer, my mother tried to enroll me in swimming lessons, but on the way to the first lesson, I grew really fearful, and I threw a temper tantrum of epic proportions, and I just started crying and crying and crying. I was not going to take these lessons. I don't know what I thought was going to happen during these lessons, but I was adamant that I was not taking these lessons. And my mother, who's so gentle and sweet and kind, pulled me aside, got in my face, and she said, if I can get my money back, you're fine. But if I can't, you will take them, and you will love them. <laughs> so thankfully, she got her money back. And for the rest of the summer, I sat on the, the edge of the pool with the mom squad and watched as my little brother took to swimming like he was the son of Aquaman. So... And I don't, again, I don't know why I had such an issue with it, but I was not going to take these swimming lessons. Like, it was not going to happen. I don't know if it was like a panic attack or what, but it was not going to happen. But because of that, I never really learned proper swimming technique. I can swim well enough to keep myself alive. I wouldn't really entrust any of your children with me to keep them alive. Um, <laughs> You know, I believe in angels protecting us, so if somebody was drowning, I believe that God would help me <laughs> save somebody. But I, I can pretty much, you know, my, my uh, like swimming consists of floating on noodles, hopping waves in the shallow end of the beach, and, or just back floats, because I do know how to do that one. So, um, but it's never stopped me from loving the water. I love the water. I love being in the pool. I love floating around. I love being at the beach. I love feeling the, the sand beneath my feet and the waves just coming up and kissing my ankles. I love being out and hopping the waves. The sound of ocean waves crashing on the shore is my favorite sound on earth. Nothing, I, I think, well actually, it's probably tied with the sound of the Harley. Those are the two things that relax me more than anything else on earth, is the sound of the ocean waves and the sound of the bike <laughs> running. But we're speaking about water today, so anyway. Um, I love the water, but even now that I'm stronger in my swimming and I know that I can keep myself alive, I'm not going to drown, I still feel more comfortable when I'm close to the shallow end. I may venture out a little bit where I have to tread water, but I want to know that in a short amount of time I can get back to where my feet are planted firmly on the ground and I can breathe without any problems. 
It makes me feel secure and comfortable. And I feel that it's that way for many Christians. When the Holy Spirit beckons us to go deeper into the living water, we resist. Many of us aren't willing to go beyond ankle deep. We believe that Jesus is our Savior and we're comfortable just wading along in the water in the shallow end of his love. We sporadically attend church. We may share the occasional inspirational quote or Bible verse on, on social media to help people to be blessed. We may even volunteer at church once or twice a year, give a little extra in the offering basket if a need arises, and occasionally tell somebody that, you know, that Jesus loves them. But when, it, when Jesus calls us to go deeper, we resist. We're not ready to go any deeper. We're comfortable there. Like, but Jesus, it feels really good on my feet. You know, I'm comfortable here. I, I don't want to get any wetter. I just bought these pants. I don't want to get them wet. I just bought these shoes. Like, I, I, don't even want to, I don't even want to be ankle deep, to be honest with you. I just kind of want to be off to the side here. Then there are those that brave the knee-deep depths. We're a little more willing to get wet with the living water, maybe a little more faithful to attend worship services. We like the feel of the presence of God in service, and for a day or so after a good one, we splash the living water that's clinging to our pants onto everyone we come in contact with. But we are nutritionally deprived because we don't feast on the word. And we're dehydrated because we're trying to live off of the few sips of living water we've received on a Sunday. But we're still resistant to go further. Then there are those that are willing to go waist deep. We touch on what it feels like to be surrounded by the living water. It feels good. It's warm. It's inviting. It's refreshing. Maybe we're very faithful to attend church. We read the word and drink of his presence, yet we still cling to the shallow end because we can touch the ground. We are still comfortable with our heads above water. We don't touch the ground, I mean, we can touch the ground, so we're not moved when the river of God moves. We can stand firmly in our own control. We're here, we're comfortable, we're not going anywhere. The waves can go around us, the water can rush around me, but I'm firmly planted in this spot, and that's where I'm comfortable. I don't want to go any further than this. Like, this is where I want to stay. We serve the Lord, but we serve out of a place of striving instead of out of a place of rest. And that causes, um, it causes us to burn out. See, when you serve from a place of striving, you're constantly, you're, you're constantly thinking that what you do is not good enough, that what you do isn't enough. When you serve from a place of rest and fully dependent on him, you realize that he's already given you an A, for every test he ever puts in front of you, you realize that he's right there with you in union with you, that he's one with you. Yes. So you're not doing it by yourself. But when you serve from being, you know, just waist deep in the water, you're in control. Right. And we're not meant to do anything that God's called us to do from our own control. We're not meant to do it. That's not the way that he designed it. So we burn out and we get tired. And yet, it's in those moments, ironically, that we burn out and we just want to give up. That's actually when we should be going deeper. But we're like, no, I'm not going deeper. I'm not going deeper. I'm done. I'm done. I'm tired. I'm, I'm burned out. I'm, I'm peopled out. I am done with people. I am done with what God's called me to do. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm striking this ground over and over and over again, and nothing's happening. You know, I, I just kind of quit. You know, I love the Lord but I, I'm just not cut out to do what he's called me to do. And so we, we may either stay put or we back away and go even shallower. Last week, my father spoke with us about baptism being symbolic of our co-crucifixion with Christ. When we go under the water, we died and are buried with Christ. And when we come up, we're raised to life with Jesus. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives his life through me. But nowhere in the word does it ever say to get out of the water. There's no instruction for that. There's no instruction in the word that says get baptized and get out of the water. Stay out of the water for the rest of your life. Don't go near water again. The word doesn't say that. 
I believe we're to live there. We're to live in that place where we are totally surrounded by God's infinite love, drowning in grace, breathing in living water, no longer in control, but completely surrendered to him. It's from the deep end that we're empowered to do what he's called us to do. So I didn't speak to any of these people uh, today, but I know Femi and Brett got baptized last week. It felt good, didn't it? It felt transformative when you were under the water and then you came back up. It was a place that you want to stay. It's a, it's a moment emotionally where you want to stay. You want to stay in that moment. We are to stay in that moment. We're not supposed to run away from that. We're supposed to stay in that moment for the rest of our lives. You know, during the summer months, we're, we're past the days of public pools now. My, my parents have a pool in their backyard now. And during the summer months, we spend a lot of Saturday or Sunday afternoons at their house playing with the nieces and the niece and nephew. And they always want Dave and I to pick them up, to hold them, to carry them, to throw them, to do all the things that aunts and uncles do <laughs> with niece and nephews in the pool. And it used to be easy, but they're getting big now. They're, you know, Asher's almost six, Isley's four, they're tall, they're heavy. So it used to be really easy for me, you know, whether we were in the water or out of the water, to pick them up, spin them around, throw them up in the air and catch them again. And now it's like, here, let Uncle Day do it. <laughs> You're hurting Kiki's arms, go to Uncle Day. Um, but in the water, it's different. I can pick them up. I can carry them around. Even Asher, who's, who's really big now and, and heavy, I can pick him up and carry him around and play with him in the pool because there's little to no resistance in the water. That's why physical therapists recommend it for people for exercise. It, it doesn't hurt your joints. It, it's little to no impact. It's good for you. It's good for you to be in the water. The water does part of the work when you're carrying somebody in the water. So it's the same way when we need to carry things for the Lord. When we are the only ankle deep in the river and try to carry the gifts, callings, and promises of God, we feel the full weight of those things. It, our bones feel it. Our joints feel it. Our muscles fatigue. We get tired. We burn out. Sometimes we just give up carrying it all together. But when we submerge ourselves in the living water <laughs> and we carry what God has given us, we from that place of being in the deep end with him, totally submerged by him, we are able to carry things longer and further than we could ever dream or imagine. Amen. Because he's carrying it with us. Yes. You know, the living water does some of the work. It pushes it along with us. We're along for the ride. It's not effort in ourselves. We're completely dependent on him. He's calling us into the deep end. He's calling us into the place where we are in over, in over our heads, like Jess saying last week. We are in over our heads, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's to this, he's calling us to this place where we can no longer walk in our own strength, to let him drown us in his river of love. You know, I was praying that while we were worshiping this morning, and just said, God, drown me in your love. And he did, to the point where my husband had to peel me up off of the floor after worship before uh, communion <laughs> was served because I was drowning in that river of love and I never wanted to leave that place. I didn't want to wake up and, and, and take communion. I just wanted to stay in this place where I was in the river with Jesus, surrounded by his love, dancing with him, singing with him, telling him how much I loved him. He was telling me how much he loved me. I wanted to stay in that place forever. When we are deep in the river, we are fully dependent on him. When we are immersed in the river, we breathe in the living water and it becomes our oxygen. We are then empowered through him because we are fully dependent on him. We no longer do anything from our own strength. We serve from a place of complete dependence. You know, we, we're in, we live in America. America is all about, we're independent we are independent. And so we grow up thinking, I don't need anybody else. Dependence is a bad thing. But see, well, I think part of the problem is Christians have equated dependence with codependence. And they're very, very different things. We should depend on each other. Yeah. In a healthy relationship, you depend on each other. 
Trust me, I was one of the most fiercely independent people you would ever meet. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. When I first met my husband and, and, and we were dating, in fact, I remember distinctly, we got in a fight one time, and I just looked him straight in the face, and I was like, I, you need to know something. I love you, and I want you in my life, but I don't need you in my life. I mean, flat out, flat out. Years later, after health issues and, <laughs> and surgeries and leaving my, my uh, you know, high-paying job and things like that and pursuing the call that God has in my heart, um, I remember us getting in a really minuscule little argument, probably something stupid. We call those nothing arguments, where you argue about something that's not of any substance, like, you know, they ran the dishwasher twice when you just ran it, you know, that kind of thing. It's a nothing argument. It has no effect on anything. We had this little argument, and I remember walking into the bedroom and thinking, man, I actually need this guy now. Somebody's got to pay the mortgage. And it was such a huge, like, like I would have ever left him over a dishwasher, but it was just this huge revelation to me because I was this fiercely independent person, and even four years into our marriage, there was still part of me that was incredibly independent, and I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know how to be interdependent on someone. I didn't know how to, to have this reciprocal dependence where I needed him and he needed me. I didn't get it. It made no sense to me because I had done everything on my own my whole life. Yes. So I did well for myself. Come on, Mom. Yes. <laughs> Who would have thought my hecklers would be my parents? But, oh, oh, my dad wants everybody to know out in Facebook land that he is not heckling me. It is just my mother. So... We, have, we as Americans have placed this whole thing about independence on such a high level, it's such a pedestal to us, that we have to be independent. If we can't do it ourselves, we haven't achieved something. If we, can't, if, if, if we aren't the only one that started a project from start to finish, then we didn't, we didn't do it. We have this idea that we have to be completely independent. But see, God's idea, when we submit to the kingdom mindset, we submit to a mindset that realizes that if it's a dream from God, it requires participation from other people to be fulfilled. If it's a dream that's only big enough that, that only you can, you can do it, it's not a big dream. God wants us to call to dream big. He wants us to work with each other. He wants us to unite with each other. He wants us to be in union with each other just as we're in union with him. We need each other, but we need God. We can't do this stuff on our, our own. You know, sometimes I think we look at, at Christianity as, okay, I got saved, I got baptized, okay, that's my diploma. Now I go out and do the work on my own. No, we're supposed to do it with them. Getting saved and getting baptized is more like a marriage. You do it together yes. with Jesus the whole time. So he's calling us into the deep end, and he's calling us into a place of dependence. He's calling us into the river to be completely submerged by the river so that it's, it's in the river that we're empowered to do the things that he's called us to do. We serve from his power, not ours. We serve from his strength, not ours. That's part of why he says that his his burden is easy and his yoke is light. Because we, if, if you have a burden that's too heavy for you to carry by yourself, that's because you were never meant to carry it by yourself. He was meant to carry it with you. We work as one, and it's through the constant connection to the flow of the living water and through the constant infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing. You don't get filled with the Holy Spirit and that's it. Right. You just constantly connect with him. And ask him to refill you, refill you, refill you. Refill me, Holy Spirit. Refill me, Holy Spirit. Refill me, Holy Spirit. I just want to be connected to you. It's through those things that we are able to do God's work. Not from our strength, but his. Corey Ten Boom, who is, I've, I've always really admired her writings, 
said it this way, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. So are some of you feeling confused, exhausted, feeling like the call that's on your life is tedious? You need to connect to the river, go into the deep end. When you serve from a heart that has been fully immersed in the deep end, you become so saturated by God's love, power, and presence that you can't ever burn out. Have you ever tried to start a fire with logs that are saturated with rainwater? Anybody? Yeah, it does not happen. It is, it is painful. I tried, I tried doing, doing this last year. We have a wood stove in our basement, and I tried lighting logs that we thought were dry. And, but they had just a little tiny bit of dampness in the middle of them. It, was, it took hours, hours to get a fire started. I was cold. I was not happy with my husband for letting the fire go out while he was at work. I kept texting him. I'm like, what am I going to do? All this wood is wet. Like, what am I going to do? He's like, plug in the little heater and snuggle the dog. <laughs> I'll be home soon. <laughs> But then my fiercely independent side was like, I can get this done. I am going to do this. So it took me about three hours to get a fire started in a little wood stove that should have taken 20 minutes. It was not fun. But I finally got it to work. So think of it this way. If you are in the river, if you're that log, and you're living submersed in the river, immersed, totally immersed, you're driftwood. You're not starting a fire with driftwood. You're not starting a fire where every cell in that log is saturated with water. It's not going to happen. That's what, where we should be. We should serve from that place where we are completely saturated. We don't burn out if we're saturated from the river. We don't burn out. We don't grow weary in well-doing. Earlier this week, I was reading through 1 John in the Passion Translation and came across the scripture in chapter 4, verse 17. By living in God, love has brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. The scripture did something to me. It made my spirit leap. When I read something that excites me, I'm just like, yes. I get so excited, and I get really excited all day long, and I just think about it. So I wanted to break that down with you all today. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us. This comes from living a life totally immersed in God, surrendered to, overwhelmed by, and drowning in the river of living water. It comes from being a laid-down lover of God that passionately pursues their relationship with Him. I want to be that kind of lover. I want to be that person. Do you? I want to be consumed by his river of living water, saturated through with his love and living every moment close to his heart. I want love to come to its full expression in me. And as we live in God, we realize more and more how good he really is. We realize more and more just what all was accomplished on that cross. We were baptized into his death and we died to sin. Romans 7, 1 through 4 explains to us the legal significance of that spiritual death. And once again, I'm reading from the Passion. It is my favorite. I write to you, dear brothers and sisters who are familiar with the law, don't you know that when a person dies, it ends his obligation to the law? For example, a married couple is bound by the law to remain together until separated by death. But when one spouse dies, the other is released from the law of marriage. So then, if a wife is joined to another man while still married, she commits adultery. But if her husband dies, she is obviously free from the marriage contract and may marry another man without being charged with adultery. So my dear brothers and sisters, the same principle applies to your relationship with God. For you died to your first husband, the law, by being co-crucified with the body of Messiah. So you are now free to marry another, the one who was raised from the dead so that you may now bear spiritual fruit for God. We died to the law of sin. We're a widow to sin. Think of it that way. You're, you're a widow to sin. It holds no legal authority over you anymore. It is no longer a part of your nature. 
We were raised to life as a new creation, and that new creation is legally free to marry another. We are legally free to become the bride of Christ. And as the bride, we are to bear fruit. Remember Ezekiel's vision? Fruit trees of all types flanking both sides of the river. The bride of Christ bearing his spiritual fruit were present on both sides of the river. Psalm 1-3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And Jeremiah 17-8 echoes that verse and adds to it by saying, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Water is needed to bear fruit. Trees that are continuously connected to a water source bear fruit. In Ezekiel's vision, we are told that the fruit is for food and the leaves are for healing. Our spiritual fruit nourishes others, and our branches bring healing. Our branches bring healing. And when our roots are deep in the river of living water, we bear fruit in every season. And I like that in Ezekiel, it said that the fruit changed each month, it bore a different crop. God knows what our world needs. God knows what our family needs. God knows what our our church needs. God knows what our, our businesses need. God knows what we need in every single season, and he's going to make sure that that's the fruit that we bear in that season. So, and not only that, but in John 7, 38, Jesus says that he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water flow through us. These, those rivers will bring healing to the land and cause things to prosper, just like in Ezekiel's vision of the Dead Sea turning into fresh water where life can flourish. Living water purifies the earth and makes new life possible. Everywhere those rivers flow, the dead seas around us will be made fresh and new. New life will sprout in them. But every river needs a source, and living in the river flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb causes the living rivers to flow through us. We have to be connected to the source. 1 John 4.17 tells us that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. When you live in the deep end, you know beyond doubt that you are not some weak-hearted, fickle sinner saved by grace that constantly battles with their flesh and has to strive for God's affection and approval. You know that you know that you know that you are a new creation and you are in union with Jesus. You are all that he is to this world. You are his love, his bride, his hands and his feet to carry the gift. God adores you and is so proud of you. He doesn't remember your past and therefore cannot define you by it. He only knows you as he sees you on the other side of the finished work of the cross. You are his beloved child, capable of everything he's called you to do. So you can't continue to look at yourself for who you once were. That person is gone and buried. You no longer have to fear judgment because Jesus bore that for you. You have been redeemed by love, and 1 John 4, 18 tells us that there is no fear in love. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. If you're walking afraid of punishment, you haven't reached love's perfection. And this isn't a level of nirvana you have to reach. This is just reaching out and grabbing hands with love's perfection. He wants to lavish his love on you all day, every day. We just have to reach out and grab it. We have to accept it. What good is a gift if you never open it? It's a gift. He gives us perfect love as a gift. The last part of the scripture says, all that Jesus now is, so are we in the world. This is the part that made my spirit leap. All that Jesus is, so are we. So are you. And you, and you, and you. So are you. Everything that Jesus is, that's what we are in this world. When we live in the deep end, we come to understand and walk in the authority of everything that Jesus is. That's what the new creation we are is made of. His love, 
his strength, his compassion, his power, his righteousness, his holiness. Through him, so are we. We walk in his same authority, connected to the heart of God, and do only what we see our Father do, just like Jesus did. We bring his living water to all those that thirst. You are his greatest love. He draws you closer every day. So don't be afraid to dive into the deep end. Don't be afraid to dive into the deep waters of his love. Don't let a sense of decorum keep you from just entering fully in. Don't worry about what somebody else is thinking when they look at you. They're not looking at you. And if they are, they probably shouldn't be here because we're here to worship. We're here to worship. We're here to worship. I spent over half of my life bound by what other people thought in the fear of that, bound by perfectionism. I, one of my favorite quotes that I've heard about this is from, um, was it Jonathan Hessler? That perfection in, perfectionism is rooted in fear, but excellence is rooted in joy. When I learned the difference, I made some changes. So I am now a recovered perfectionist. But I grew up with that fear that if something wasn't perfect, then I couldn't do it. It would keep me from trying to do things. I wouldn't do things at all. If that might have been why I didn't want to do swimming lessons. Yeah. If I didn't think I could excel at something, I didn't do it. I excelled at a lot academically. I was bright. I was confident in that. But when it came to other things, I wouldn't even try it, especially anything athletic, yeah. because I knew I couldn't excel at it. And so if I wasn't going to excel, I couldn't find any enjoyment in it. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun for me. And the funny thing is I'm not even a competitive person. I'm competitive with myself. I, I, I'm not competitive with other people. I, 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 don't, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I just don't. Like, I want everybody to do well. I just want everybody to have fun. When we play games, I don't care if I win. I just want to have fun. So I'm not a competitive person by nature, but I do compete with myself. And so that competition with myself kept me from diving into the deep end. And when I learned to deal with that fear and realized that perfect love drives out fear, and I dove in that deep end so fast, and I have never gotten out, and I never will. And I go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper every day. Deeper and deeper and deeper. Because that's where I want to live. That's where I'm happy. That's where the joy that fuels excellence comes from is being deep in the river of God. So I'm just going to tell you today and encourage you, don't fear the deep end. Run, jump in, cannonball in. Make a big splash. Splash around. Enjoy being saturated by his all-consuming presence and infinite love. Let love be brought to its full expression in you today. So are you ready to dive in this morning? Are you ready to become a laid-down lover of God, free from fear, free from striving? Are you ready to relinquish control in your life? I know that's a hard one, but are you ready to give up control? And trust that he knows more than you know. He's God. How can he not know more than you? See, we try to control the world, but we don't even see the whole world. We need to relinquish control, be a laid down lover for God. Are you ready to get your hair wet? <laughs> to surrender fully to his heart and reach love's perfection.